Today we are at AJ's. They are going to take us through a class of cooking brisket, ribs, all of their secret recipes, how they do everything. We are super pumped. Let's get into yep. it. Yeah, let's That's start. Right. Today we're going to talk about barbecue. We're going to eat barbecue and we're going to teach you all of our secrets and everything we do here with the hopes that it'll either inspire you to do it yourselves at home or when you ruin your own barbecue, you know where to go to get good barbecue. <laughs> so how many of y'all have a smoker at home already? Put your hands down if it's a Traeger. Oh. So how many of you have a real, how many, how many of you have like a stick burner, like a wood burning smoker? Yeah, that's not fair. You're, you're a barbecue guy. What kind of smoker do you have? Just a barrel. I love it. You don't even know the brand, right? Barrel. It's a barrel. Yeah, so smokers, people get caught up on the equipment a lot. And so we talk about that first. You know, Traeger's cool and pellet grills are fine, but you know, traditional Texas barbecue, to really understand the science and the fire and the heat behind it, I, I like to start with stick burners and then kind of work your way backwards. It's good to have a pellet smoker in your repertoire of cookers because you guys that have cookers, you may have one or two. And if you have two, you'll probably have four one day. And if you have six, you'll probably not have one wife. <laughs> I had to open a restaurant to keep buying more smokers. So, and I still have a wife. So. so yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about like, you know, fire science and what barbecue is and what we're trying to achieve by cooking with wood and cooking slowly. So barbecue's history, it dates way, way back. It's really the only food that Americans invented. You know, you'll hear like a, a phrase like as American as apple pie or as hot dogs. And those things are not American. Pastries, most of them are European. Bread traditions have been around for thousands of years. Uh, hot dogs are definitely not American and pizza is definitely not American. But this kind of barbecue you will not find outside of this country. You know, I've had a, a lot of folks ask me to consult at different parts of the world and to do American style barbecue because it's very like, uh, it's very on trend. And it has been, I think it never never goes out of style, but it had a real hot point in the last 10 years. We had a couple of two, three year cycles where it's been super hot all over the world. In fact, there's two places in downtown Paris, France that have JNR Euler smokers, which is like the Cadillac. It's one of the best smokers you can buy for like a commercial operation. It's not a, an offset pit like this, but you, you will rarely find a pit like what you see outside here at inside a barbecue restaurant. You can see ours is not inside. So J&R Euler makes all wood burning smokers and they've got two of them in downtown Paris. One of the places is called The Beast and I have yet to go there, but my wife wants to go to France. So that gives me a good reason to take her there and she can eat croissants and do whatever other people do. And go look at the Eiffel Tower and I'll go look at The Beast. So, you know, but barbecue specifically is American because of what we cook, the types of meat we cook and then the woods that we're using. So I, I had a guy ask me to come over and help him open a barbecue restaurant in Dubai and our conversations only got a couple emails in. Anybody know the problem? No wood. There's no wood. There's no trees. So you're in the middle of a desert. There aren't trees. You can't have wood shipped over there. That just doesn't make sense. So you can cook with charcoal, but to get this really traditional flavor that we get from Central Texas barbecue, you really have got to cook with wood. So we like to cook with logs. We call it a stick burner. Our smokers were called stick burners, just meaning that they burn logs. And we cook with whole logs. We don't cook with chunks or we don't use any charcoal. Uh, charcoal's not bad. Charcoal just doesn't have the same kind of flavor that you're going to get cooking from uh, when you're cooking with, with white oak or post oak. This is what grows primarily in Central Texas. And it got its name from its other common use, which is to build posts at ranches. So uh, post oak is a variety of white oak. It's very dense. The trees are never get very big. So they're great for fence posts and they're great for cooking barbecue. So when we're talking about barbecue, the first thing I like to talk about after we talk about wood and you know type of smoker and everything is, is the style of heat that we're using. So everybody in the room is probably familiar with direct heat grilling. That's like when you're cooking on a grill and the fire, like what we've got over here, the fire is directly beneath whatever you're cooking. So this is a Santa Maria grill. You guys that can't see, I'll wheel this over. So when you're direct heat grilling, your fire is directly beneath whatever you're cooking. Very simple, right? The thing with this style of cooking is it's very, very hot from the bottom and then there's no heat on top. So you're flipping over everything that you're cooking. Hey, there's my daughter. Hey, Brighton, you gonna come say hi? No, she's nope. shy. <laughs> so you're cooking with direct heat here and you're usually cooking leaner cuts of meat like steak or even like a burger or a pork chop. And then you flip it over. 
I know this is like very elementary to some of you, but I like to break it down and start with that, you know, grilling style that everybody knows. Direct heat is what you do when you're grilling. When you move your fire away from the firebox or from your uh, smoke cooking chamber, you know, it's, there's not a big difference from where we actually start cooking. Those of you who couldn't hear, he was asking if there's a big temperature difference. You see about 25 degrees or so. Our pit inside that we use in the restaurant, there's about a 75 degree difference between the top shelf and the bottom shelf. This all just has one shelf. So from left side to right side, as long as you don't open the door, the stuff right on the fire definitely is hotter. And like at Thanksgiving when we did turkeys, I switched all the turkeys that were in this side with the turkeys that were in this side halfway through the cook. And then the turkeys, the, the turkeys that were in the middle just stayed in the same place. They cooked the same, the, the same spot in our smoker the whole time. So, you know, if you design your pit right, or if you buy a good pit, there really shouldn't be a huge temperature difference. But like, you know, the word pit master, it really means that you're master in your pit. Like you learn your pit, you learn where the hot spots are, you learn where the cold spots are, and then you move the different meats around according to like what you want to have done when. And that's all developed just through, over the years that you'll start to, anybody ever cook competitions like KCBS competitions? You guys again? Yeah, figured. So in competitions, you've got to cook two to four meats so you, you can choose. Sometimes you can even just do one, but you know, the guys who are real pros are doing four meats. And so they got to time everything to be done at the same, well, there's different turn in times uh, depending on the type of competition you're doing. But you know, turkey smokes a lot less than a brisket does and pulled pork cooks different than ribs. So, you know, if you're making multiple proteins, you'll find that you want the hot spots and the cold spots in your smoker, and you want a couple of different types of equipment so that you can time everything. And, you know, the fancy word for that is mise en place, to have everything in its place, have a purpose and a place for everything. And that's one of the things I like about stick burners. Because they have hot spots and cold spots, you get to master your pit. And to me, there's just a little bit more romance with cooking barbecue when you're cooking with logs. You know, the set it and forget it kind of smoker to me is just not as much fun. You know, you're sitting there for like 14 hours. What are you gonna do that whole time? Just drink? Yeah. I mean, pro probably, <laughs> probably you will be drinking, but drinking and playing with fire is a lot more fun than drinking and playing with a thermostat. That's just me anyways. And don't get too carried away with like trying to buy the fanciest equipment and please like buy used equipment. There's some other guy out there, a great gal, I, I guess like anybody out there who bought a smoker a couple of years ago. They've used it twice in two years and they're just like, nah, I'm never gonna get into this, I'm too busy. And then they'll sell it used for like half the price of what they paid for it. And this doesn't have any moving parts to it. So it's just metal. So don't, I mean, it'll be nice and new and clean looking when you get it, but it won't stay that way. You know, it's, it's not like a classic car. This is like more of like a vintage car where you want it to have a little patina to it. You want it to have some character. So don't be afraid to buy used equipment. You know, somebody else already seasoned it for you. And if it's got a, if it's, again, two standards are built of like a thick building material, like heavy metal, ceramic, or something that's well insulated, and then a good size firebox. You wanna make sure you have enough room to burn your fire. So direct heat grilling, indirect heat offset smoker for smoking. Kamado style, so that's like a ceramic style. I like to use those for grilling. So the Big Green Egg makes one or Kamado Joe. I've got one of those. I find that they're, they're nice because they're thick and they retain heat really well. So you can get that grill up to like a thousand degrees. For smoking, there's not a ton of room to like, there's a firebox separator. Well, it's not a firebox. It's just like a divider of the chamber. It's all one chamber. So uh, if you guys haven't seen a big green egg, it'd be like this, but with about an inch of ceramic all the way around it. So again, really good conductive heat and retained heat in the walls of, that, of the grill which is great for direct heat grilling. And if you put something down the middle to separate it from directly where you're cooking, you can smoke on it. You just don't have a lot of space. So I like to use that for grilling and then something else for smoking. Yeah, they're safe. I mean, you're gonna hear all kinds of opinions about like yeah. flying embers. But I'll tell you like an open grill like that, during fire ban season, you really can't use those open fire grills. But smoke. So when we're cooking barbecue, we're using wood as a fuel and that wood is going to give us a really natural flavor. But it's just, it's, it's, it's a flavor. There's not like one right wood to use. So you can use any hard wood. So fruit woods will give you a different flavor than say uh, nut woods. Uh, oak will give you a different flavor than the fruit in the nut woods. So play around with the different woods and decide which one you like best. But it's just a flavor. Don't get stuck on like, we have to use this wood. 
We use post oak for everything we do here. I really like post oak because it has this really clean, defined, smoky flavor without ever becoming bitter. When you're using fruit woods or nut woods, if you put too much smoke on it, you can get like a dirty smoke. That's one thing I didn't talk about. So like you guys see the fire burning over here. You can see our exhaust. The exhaust has this really thin gray or thin blue smoke coming out of it. That's what you want. You don't want like a thick black smoke. That's gonna make your food taste very, very acrid. And you'll see it on the surface of the meat. Like you want a nice bark, you want nice color on your meat, but you don't want it to be just coated in ash. So there is such thing as too, too much smoke. Again, just think of it in simple terms. Don't overthink it. Smoke is a flavor. Just like pepper is a flavor, just like salt is a flavor, it's a seasoning. So you don't want to add too much, but everyone's different. Some people really like to over salt their food. Somebody, some people like to really over smoke their food. Find out what you like the best and then that's your barbecue. We're going to show you what we do here today. But again, like go home and do what you like to do on your smoker, see what you like, and then develop your own style of barbecue. You want to be able to split this wood and like it's nice to set up a little like chopping area and, and splitting area and it's swinging ax over your head. How many of y'all chop wood by hand? It's a very, very therapeutic thing to do. I highly recommend it, but you can lose a toe pretty easily pretty good. if yeah. you don't know what you're doing. And so we have this log splitter. There's a bunch of different companies that make these. We have actually a few different brands. This one is called the uh, Kindling Cracker. But basically this is an inverted ax. So that the splitter blade is on the bottom and you just stick that log in there and you don't even have to swing this. You can just go. Who wants to try it? If you have a knot in the wood, it's going to be harder to split the wood in that area. There. <laughs> I gave him the trick. It's like the birthday candles that don't blow out. So we're going to do this kind of like a cooking show. We're going to show you how to do it, but we're not going to wait, uh, make you wait 16 hours to eat your brisket. So we've got brisket made for you. <laughs> First, we're gonna wow. show you how to trim it down. So brisket, how many of y'all, how many of y'all have cooked a brisket at home? How many of you guys have ruined a brisket? Um, You're not alone. You know, I don't think anybody makes a great brisket on their first try. The better equipment you have, like, and I don't mean better like a fancy smoker, but I just mean like a really well insulated smoker. And the more experience you have with fire control and temperature control, the better that brisket's gonna turn out. But one of the most important things is starting out with a good product. So brisket is coming from the chest area of a steer. So there's two briskets in each steer. Cut a brisket, we call this the packer cut. This is how the meat packers sell it. And in this packer cut brisket, there are two individual muscles. One of them is called the point, which is this thicker side here. And the other side is called the flat, which is the flatter side. Those two muscles combined are called the packer cut brisket. And then there's a vein of fat that runs between them. And then on top here, we have what's called the fat cap, which is that white cap of fat on top of the, that meat. And on the back side, you can see I don't have a fat cap. So you're never gonna find a brisket that has a fat cap on both sides. So the first thing we're gonna do, and we, and we buy these from Harris Ranch, and these are USDA Prime. You know, over years of cooking barbecue, you change your mind, you change your opinion, you change your style. I used to say that you didn't need to buy prime meat to cook barbecue, because you're spending so much time cooking this tough cut of meat in the smoker that if you do it the right way, you can turn any bad cut of meat into good barbecue. Now, I still believe that, but I will say starting out with a better cut of meat gives you a better fighting chance at getting a good finished piece of barbecue. The weight of this is about 12, 13 pounds. And, and this is what I like to cook with. Uh, for the restaurant, we, we like big briskets and we like them to all be about the same weight. I would advise you to not, anything under 10 pounds is gonna be a little bit harder to, to get quite as juicy just cause there's not enough fat in it. So look for briskets that are around 12 pounds. You guys that are buying briskets, where are you buying them from? Costco. Retail. Costco's a great place to buy meat. There's meat markets that'll sell it. They're gonna be a couple bucks more per pound, but you know, again, we're looking for that stamp of USDA Prime if you can get it. And we're paying around $4 right now, around $4 a pound. So, you know, it's, it's an investment. You got about 50 bucks into this piece of meat, but 
you know, think of this compared to like serving a protein dinner of steak or pork chop or anything else, 50 bucks, and you're going to feed probably 12, 13 people with 50 bucks. So it's not a terribly expensive piece of meat. If you do it right, it becomes very expensive if you ruin it, because now you got to come here and pay $30 a pound for the brisket. So today we're going to have Pat, our pit master here, who's also from Chicago. So Pat's going to kind of give us a rundown. So typically I'll start just on this end, I'll work my way up. I like to round out each corner. Uh, you're going to have a lot thicker corner on this side than you do over here. So the more even you get that, the better. So I'm going to start on this corner here and kind of just round that, get it a little more aerodynamic. Uh, you can save these scraps. Uh, we last couple weeks we've been grinding it. You can make meatloaf, burgers, stuff like that. Um, and then you're going to round this side out a little bit. You don't want to trim too much meat off because, you know, that's just money you're kind of wasting, especially in a restaurant. Just kind of off colored and uh, just not very good looking. So I always trim that off too. Just get a nice even cut. And then once you get that, you can kind of see how much fat is on the whole side of it. And you want a good like quarter inch um, throughout the entire brisket from top to bottom, like a number two pencils worth, you know. Uh, so I'm just gonna keep going up here. And the point, point typically has a lot more fat on it than the, uh, than the flat. So you just wanna get it nice and even. If you nick the meat a little bit, that's all right. Um, that's just gonna happen. I still do it every time I trim a brisket. He does it so easily like he's walking. <laughs> walking and talking and breathing. I'm just gonna flip it over so I can see a little better here. And every brisket's gonna be different. It's gonna have a different amount of fat on it. Some briskets you're not gonna have to trim like nearly anything off. Like I can tell that one barely has any fat, which is nice. We're gonna have one of saves the, us some money. Have one one of the class members do the easy one. Yeah, there we go. So this is pretty good from top to bottom here. I just leave it like that, and then on the other side. Uh, so we throw it in a big tilt skillet, which is just like a giant pot, and then we fill it with water just until above the the fat, and then you just cook all that water off, and then by the time it's done, it takes about four to five hours. By the time it's done, you're just left with liquid fat, just pure fat. By the time you get to this point, you're not gonna be able to really sell it because it's all gonna be fat. Um, so just go down straight like that and over until you're about at that quarter inch. So yeah, so again, this is called the deckle. This piece of fat right here goes straight through the flat and the point to the other side where you got a nice hard piece of fat there. So the idea is just to get enough out of there, but to leave enough in that you're not completely separating the flat and the point before you're cooking it. So then you're left with kind of this flap here, which is fine. And then I'll flip it over. You're gonna have some silver skin on the back here, um, some random fat. It's not that important to get this little stuff off. I mean, if you've got time on your hands, you might as well just do it. Uh, but this point here, just trim a little bit of that off. And you don't want to like really dig in and get all that out because you're just pulling too much out. And then when you're smoking it, if you pull too much of this fat out, that's right here, your point can kind of collapse while you're cooking it and then it gets too tender because it's just not thick enough. That's what I've noticed. Uh, so I'll just pull some of this stuff. And we'll talk about what we're looking for for tenderness when it's done, when we're serving brisket. It's, it's easier to nice. show you with the finished product. That's, that's about it. That's what we do here. You just want a nice, even, flat bottom and a nice, you know, quarter inch across the top there. It's good to go. So if that's even across, you don't need more of the Typically not, no, because um, you don't really need to. If anything, I, I would leave like, you know, a quarter inch down here and less on the, on the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, but I don't see the reason to, because it's all going to render down and you're still going to have a, like a good amount of fat. Uh, you don't leave more fat on the flat than you do on the point. I just I like to have a nice even amount of fat on my briskets, but someone else might tell you some something else. You know, it's like it's personal preference, like a lot of what Jared was saying. Yeah. And when you're doing this at home and you got a lot of extra time, you may want to like be very meticulous, or like when you're doing competitions, be very meticulous about preparing your briskets a specific way. When we're doing like 20 of these at a time, you know, we have our way that you saw how fast he did that. He's your brisket trim and start to finish the whole session in an hour yeah i can do you know i get done with two minutes you know per brisket at yeah. this point two minutes of brisket how about that <laughs> all right so our briskets are ready to go in the smoker now so before we started trimming those briskets what do we have to do first light your fire you're not allowed to answer the questions you work here you've got this you got the cheat study guide so you gotta light your fire first before you do any of this. So you light your fire, you crack a beer. Before you drink too much of the beer, you start trimming your briskets. <laughs> your fire starts burning and you get your pit up to a nice even temperature. That's super important. Remember, you want that nice clean smoke going through it. You don't want to start your fire. And while the start, when your fire starts, you're gonna have a lot of flame and you're gonna have a lot of that acrid kind of black smoke. So let that fire burn down until it's coals and then you put your barbecue in. We load the brisket in with the fat side up, and I'm gonna need another cutting board for clean meat, for, for uh, cooked meat. So we load the brisket in with the fat side up, and you cook it for about an hour to an hour and a half per pound of meat. Now I can't tell you what happens for the next 14 hours while it's in there, but the key is maintain a nice even temperature. And don't look at it too much. You know, there's this like thing where you want to look at the meat every 10 minutes. If you're looking, you're not cooking. I think that was Myron Mixon said that. There isn't flavor wise that I've found with brisket because it's spending so much time in that smoker. We're talking, you know, 12, 14, 15 hours to let the spices sit on there before you put it in, you're not gonna have an enhanced flavor profile, but what it will help you do is get everything together in the morning a little bit faster. So if you're cooking barbecue on a Saturday, trim your briskets on Friday night, trim them down, season them, put them in the fridge overnight, and then on Saturday morning, when you wake up at four in the morning, you can start your fire, I guess you can crack your beer if that's your thing, or a Bloody Mary, it's a little early for a beer. Uh, if your pit's lit, you're allowed to get lit, I guess, is the old saying. Can you do a once over in here with a dry mop? But yeah, if you're if you're if your pit's lit, so are you. It's kinda like going to brunch, right? You're allowed to get drunk at brunch for some reason. Like it's the middle of the morning and you're allowed to drink. Only if it's brunch. Is there This is butcher paper or peach paper, so and that's again that's like an old texas thing and they were just using what they had available to them so raw meat goes in white paper and cooked meat goes in brown or peach paper and the idea of wrapping it in the paper so i thought i'll get into that now so we light our fire we get our, our temperature up we put the brisket in and we let it smoke until it's about 190 internal but really like like i said we're looking for a specific tenderness if you're sticking a, a meat probe or a meat thermometer in here it should be like I'm sticking it into butter, but the meat shouldn't be falling apart. So like when I slice this, this is what it should look like. <laughs> Why are you going so fast? It's always like the moment of truth because I didn't cook this brisket. I mean, I trust Pat, so you're stressed, but like what if one time I open it up and it's like, yeah, it's back here. <laughs> now these look good. Yeah, good question. So we smoked the meat. I just wanted to do that because it's cool, but we're, we'll, we'll backtrack. Smoke the meat until it's ready, <laughs> until it's about 190 inside. Take it out of the smoker. This is one of the most important parts of your brisket cook. Let it rest at room temperature, wrapped for about an hour. So what happens is that the intramuscular fat in here, when it melts, it's like, think of it like butter. I'm gonna use that as a good reference to fat because butter isn't fat, right? It's not a, a, an animal protein, but it is fat. So when you melt butter, it's liquid. 
when butter's soft at room temperature, it has some sol it's solid, right? So when all of that fat melts inside my brisket, like you, you see on Instagram, these guys cutting their briskets open and juice is running all over the table. And it looks really cool for Instagram, but you're not, all that juice is on your table now. You're not licking the table, so you've lost all that flavor. So let your meat rest at room temperature and all of that liquid that has melted when it was at 190, when it rests down to 165, 160, it's gonna solidify just enough so that it'll stay with the meat. So you'll have flavor inside your meat or instead of on your table. So when your brisket's done, it should be tender, but it shouldn't be falling apart. So when you drape it over your finger, that's usually a good test. This is a really nice looking brisket, man. Woo! So it should drape over your finger and it should, you know, look like that, but it shouldn't be falling apart when you hold it. But when I pull it, just barely it comes apart. Nice work, Pat. Pat needs a raise. Pat, is your dad here, Pat? My dad? Well, somebody said you need a raise. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, you got four barbecue sauces on your table. Barbecue sauce we add after we or, or, you know, we add it on the side. We don't want to cover the barbecue in sauce because then that becomes the dominating flavor. And you want to cut against the meat grain. And the, where the point in the flat is, the meat grain runs a couple directions, so you can kind of cut on an angle. And when you're ordering barbecue in a restaurant, they'll ask you if you want point or flat. And even a nice thick piece like that still pulls right apart. Yeah, there are so many better spots, but that's a, jalapeno like, sauce? Rudy's is a staple for sure. So the next cut of meat we're going to work on, I start out with brisket because brisket's like the gold standard. It's the hardest meat to do. It's the hardest meat to do right. And then we flip the script and we go to the easiest meat, which is pulled pork. How many of y'all have made pulled pork before? How many of you have ruined the pulled pork? See, nobody, oh, one person. <laughs> pulled pork, you know, if you're doing like a party, if you're doing something important and you haven't quite mastered brisket, if your brisket's like every other brisket's good or you know, you just don't feel like you got it or like your in-laws are coming over or something, pulled pork is one that you're always gonna hit it on the head it's gonna be exa exactly the same every time. I mean, even our briskets, they're pretty consistent, but I had a guy in a couple classes ago say to me, uh, man, well, what's a reason in the break, he didn't say it in front of everybody, but I'll tell the story. He's like, well, what, what's a reason that a brisket would be like flavorless? And I was like, well, I mean, there, that's, a, that's a pretty broad question. I, there could be a lot of reasons. Could you give me more details? And he's like, ah, oh, man, it's usually good, this place I go, but it wasn't good one time, and I just wonder why, and, I, I, I asked a couple more questions. I was like, oh, was that here? Because he didn't want to tell me. I could tell he didn't want to tell me. He's like, yeah, it was here. And I was like, oh, well, that's that. You don't be embarrassed. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed. Like, that's just not, brisket is not, it's impossible to have every single brisket turn out great. Tony, you were telling me you went to Franklin's and it was great a couple times. And then one time it was like dog food, you know? I don't, I don't think you said that, but. Franklin, Franklin's about the experience though, you know, you're waiting in line, you're tailgating, you're drinking beer, you're throwing the football. Yeah, drinking too much, yeah. Drinking too much, they sell you beer before they even get inside. Yeah. Does everybody know what Franklin barbecue is? I've referenced it several times. It's like, it's like the most well-known barbecue place probably in the world now. Uh, it's a guy that opened on, in a food truck in Austin and then got top 50 on that Daniel Vaughn list, Texas Monthly, and then he, uh, he sells out I mean, Snow's sells out earlier, but Franklin's is open five or six days a week. I think it's six days a week. And they're, they're just like lying around the block. There's like a Twitter handle for the Franklin barbecue line. You know, it kind of became a thing of like that everybody goes there to wait in line and hang out. So, so pulled pork, you're gonna get good pulled pork almost anytime you order it, you know, and there's, there's a couple different ways to make it, but the basics of it are you're taking a pork shoulder, or this here is called the pork butt, Anybody know the difference between a pork butt and a pork shoulder? It's not a different part of the pig. It sounds like that though, right? The shoulder, the butt. 
So these are this, this is an old term. It's called the Boston butt. And it just boss, a meat processor in Boston started cutting pork shoulders into smaller pieces, and they packaged them in barrels called butt barrels. So that was just the name of the container that they put it in before they shipped it around, and so it became known as the Boston butt. So it's still a pork shoulder. There's no trimming to do on this. This is something you could prepare after you got drunk. I mean, it's really easy to do. You have a small, thin fat cap on top, no fat on the backside. We're buying bone in, you get a little bit better flavor from that. And the rub we use on our pork, we don't make this here in class, but we will give you the recipe. This is 14 ingredients. So pork has a little bit more, is more, more of a blank canvas when it comes to flavor. Brisket, you want that nice defined like beef, fat, salt and pepper, and a few other things. Pork, we've got salt, pepper, onion powder, garlic powder, brown sugar, paprika, thyme leaf, basil leaf, oregano leaf, dried crushed red pepper, cumin, celery seed, coriander. Did I miss one? I don't think I did. 14 ingredients. And we have this co-pack that the Spice Guy local here in town, you, anybody get Spice Guy stuff? Spice Guy. Savory Spice is another good place to get spices, but we we're, we don't sell ours here, So, but we are gonna give, uh, does Pat, have, we have those ready today? We have it ready, I just have to finish it? All right, all right. So we almost have it. We almost have it ready. All right. So we almost have it ready to sit to. We, we, before you guys leave, we'll give you some of this pork rub, and we give you these recipes. The pork is very, very simple. Just coat it on all sides, and this is something where, like, when we're doing a whole pig, we might inject it with some apple cider vinegar or something else, and you can play around cooking pulled pork in sauce. You know, a lot of people. Not a lot. I, they're, they're, uh, pulled pork is something that a lot of people make outside of a smoker too. Like, and it, it doesn't taste like wildly different. I, I don't think I could tell you the best pulled pork I ever had. I, I just, it's just not, you could have really, really good pulled pork and sometimes there's dry pulled pork, but most of it is really right in this range of like, oh, it's, it's tender, it's falling apart. You put some barbecue sauce on it, but people will make this in a crock pot. There's all kinds of ways to make this. This is like the same as, a, a, or similar to like cochinita pibil, like a Mexican dish, like when you, if you wrap it in banana leaves and bury it in the ground. We get a little bit of smoke on this on our pork shoulder, but it doesn't get nearly as smoky as the beef brisket, even though it's cooked for the same amount of time. So we just rub these butts down and they go in the smoker. Now a pro trick that I'll share with you that I like, I always like, uh, if pork doesn't dry out, but there's not so much fat on it like a brisket. I, I found sometimes the underside of my pork when I put it in the smoker would get a little bit too crispy. So we started cooking them in hotel pans. A hotel pan is a restaurant term for just like a deep pan that uh, goes in a steam well. And I found doing it that way, the whole pan would fill up with liquid and I would have a really, really juicy like confit style cooking. That's how we do our, our chicken thighs too is you can cook it in the juices and it's really good, but it wasn't smoky enough. So now we can put our, we put our pork butts just on a shallow pan like this so that the underside of them stays nice and juicy, but you still get a bunch of bark on the top. So, and again, like you develop your kind of little, the way, the techniques that you use for your cooker at home. You know, if you want to cook stuff in pans or you said the foil boat, that's probably kind of the same concept so that that underside stays nice and juicy, but the top still gets barky. So we do do that with our pulled pork. And our chicken thighs, yeah. Yeah, so for chickens, we, do, we don't do chicken quarters here anymore. We do just boneless chicken thighs. We kind of found our sweet spot in that. Every barbecue place has like the thing, what's that? They didn't sell. No, the quarters didn't sell. No, but chicken thighs do. Yeah, chicken thighs people really like. And there's a, every barbecue place has like their little niche thing that's other than like pulled pork, brisket, sausage, and ribs. So we do, uh, chicken thighs are something that we do that I know a lot of places don't do and we make a pulled chicken with it. There's places that do lamb, uh, game meat. So there's always, I, and I, when, as a barbecue guy, when I travel and eat barbecue, I always wanna try the brisket if it's a place I trust. I don't usually order the pulled pork. I, I like to order the ribs and then I like to try whatever their thing is, whether it's a lamb rib or uh, you know a, a beef shank or a pork chop. Who does those? Is that Snows that does the smoked pork chops? Pork steaks. Pork steaks, that's what it is. 
pastrami, we do a pastrami here. Pastrami is a brisket, by the way. Pastrami is the same muscle as brisket. Uh, it's also the same as corned beef. Pastrami is basically a smoked corned beef. And the reason that you call that corned beef a corned beef is because they cure the beef with salt corns. And that's just what they used to call them, just big chunks of salt. And they cure it or they brine it in a salty water and then it becomes a corned beef. And then you cover it in like an herby rub and then you smoke it and you call that pastrami. How many of you guys have had our pastrami here? Oh. Got a pastrami fan? So our pastrami here, like when you think of pastrami, you typically think of like a deli meat, like thinly sliced. But if you go to like Cat's Deli in New York, or if you go up to Montreal and you go to uh, Schwartz or any of the Montreal smoked meat places, that's what our pastrami is inspired on. It's a rich, smoky flavor, super over the top herby flavor. It's Wagyu beef, so we're cheating a little bit because that's just like a really quality, you know, high quality beef. But back to pork, because pork's important too. Uh, so our pulled pork, again, same process as the beef. We want to get our smoker lit, get our smoke, our, the, the, the pit going to about 225, 250 degrees. And then we want to smoke the pulled pork until it falls apart. I'm going to do this like TV cooking show trick again, where I just pull it out already done. So you can see we've got the nice color on the top of it. The pork is going to be done when it's right around 200 degrees internal. So we cook it a little bit hotter than the beef. We don't slice this. I've seen places that, uh, that slice like a pork shoulder steak and that's a different thing. That's cool. But to make pulled pork, we want to cook this until it's just falling apart. That's what it should look like. The bone should come out nice and clean. This is a lot easier to serve to big groups too. So like, back to that like if you're cooking for your in-laws or your wedding or whatever big party that you needed to turn out like perfect for do yourself a favor and do pulled pork it's easier to make it you know to guarantee that it's going to come out the right way and then you can serve like there's no slicing you can serve like 30 40 people really really quickly it gets hot right in the center there Uh, it's about an hour, well, less than, yeah, maybe an hour and 20 minutes a pound. So a pork butt, that size pork butt's going to take you about 12 hours. The nice thing about pork butts is you really got to leave them in there for a long time to overcook them. Where with brisket, if you overcook it and it's too tender or it's dried out, you know, that can happen if you leave it in for like an hour too long. Pork butt, you've got like a good range of like you want it to be falling apart, so you don't want to take it out too early, but when it's done, it could probably be in that smoker for like another hour and it's not going to hurt it. Boneless is fine. Yeah. It's, you're not going to, it's the bone in here. We used to do boneless and I don't find, I used to like do boneless and I would stuff like a, an onion inside. And then, it, you know, you, you pay a little bit more per pound for the boneless pork shoulder. So, but you know, I, I think that bone always adds flavor a little bit, but it's not necessary. So Tony, you were asking about, about the ribs though. being overdone. So yeah. on the lean side of the ribs, if you cook them as long as we do. I was just showing them. The fatty one, the fatty ribs are great, but the lean ones on the end, that's the danger you run of leaving them cooked too long. Yeah. Maybe you could tell everybody, you know, I learned this lesson a long time ago, and how to order barbecue. Don't teach us that. So in other words, if you go to a barbecue place and see a bunch of ribs, you might want like the ends or like the middles. And one time I went to a barbecue place, I got the ends and I hated it. They go, it's worse barbecue. And the owner says, well, come here. Tell them what you want. Yeah. Maybe you can show them like, because you, you obviously have a passion for barbecue. And when you go to different places, you get exactly what you want because you want to try it. Yeah. Now we have a video on how to order barbecue. And you know exactly what you want. So we did it with Patrick when we first got here, the same thing, just order what we want. But maybe you can walk them through a rib. Yeah, sure. So when you're looking at ribs, and especially with beef ribs, so beef ribs, you got a fat middle because our beef ribs, they're like dinosaur bones. Each one's like this big. And the edge pieces, we sell them for less because they don't have as much meat on them. And the middle beef rib has a ton of fat on it. So when you're ordering ribs, and when you're at a barbecue place, uh, that, this is, we, we cut everything right in front of you. Not all barbecue places do that, but if they do that, take advantage of that. We're doing that because we want you to say to us, Oh, give me those three bones in the middle. So if I take a fresh rack of ribs out like this, 
and I'm ready to cut them and I'm going over here and a customer says, and we'll, we'll usually try to coach you through this. That's what the cutters are for. But if we're cutting off the end here and you want the good middle bones, just ask the person cutting the meat, you know, for the middle ones. Cause these middle ribs are going to have a ton of meat on them and be nice and fatty. And then the end ribs, they're going to be a little cheaper cause they don't weigh as much, but they're just not going to be quite as thick and quite as juicy. I think they're all good, but yeah, when the, when the guy who's cutting the meat is on the board, watch what he's doing and ask for what you want. If you like leaner meat, ask for lean meat. Again, we usually will probe you for that. We'll usually say, do you want fatty or lean? But if you're getting something that you don't want at a barbecue place, always speak up about it. Cause we're here to, we're here to serve you. We're here to give you what you want. We don't want to give you meat that you're not going to like, you're not going to eat. So Texas is mostly like a beef rib state. I, I, we, I get that question a lot, like what's the difference between pork ribs and beef ribs? It's always hard to answer without sounding like, I mean, one's a pig and one's a cow. <laughs> beef ribs, you can find pork ribs almost anywhere. So it is like, I mean, we work in the business, uh, us here anyways, we work in the restaurant business. So we know what pork ribs and beef ribs, we know the difference. One, uh, and if I say to you, one's a pig, one's a cow, that seems simple enough, but how many of you, and this is not like a, you know, this is not like qualify or disqualify you, but how many of you have seen a beef rib yeah. in a restaurant? Okay, a decent amount of people. But, you know, if I asked that question 10 years ago, a lot of people hadn't, haven't seen one. Or if you've seen like a short rib that's cut off of the full beef rib, it's a much smaller rib. But when you get like a smoked beef rib from a Texas style barbecue restaurant, they're like this big. They, you know, they've got about a pound and a half of meat on them. You can't eat a whole beef rib by yourself. I'd be very impressed. That'd be a good challenge. We should do that challenge on your show. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah, you could do it. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, a whole beef rib. A middle bone? And so that culture of European delis and sausages and all of that went to both of those cities and bagels. So in New York, you've got bagels, pastrami, and hot dogs. In Montreal, you've got wood fire bagels. Anybody, anybody been to Montreal for food? It's like one of the best food cities in the world. Truly, truly. It very much reminds me Warner. of Chicago and New York, like mixed. It's not as like fast as New York, but it's really, really diverse like Chicago and, and New York. It's just a lot cleaner. In Montreal, they've always smoked the corned beef into Montreal smoked meat. And it's very smoky, very herby, very, very like umami season. It has a lot of pop to it. So that's just a different style of pastrami, Montreal smoked meat. And that's like our pastrami here is more like a Montreal smoked meat than it is a pastrami. We got our custard filled cornbread coming out here. Larry ate, is taking some bites before it just went, just testing it first. So this summer we're going to be doing some more outdoor events here. We're setting up a couple of cool things for AJ's coming up. We're going to be setting up a bar inside right now. We will pour you like neat whiskey or <laughs> uh, tap beer, but we're going to be taking out one of our walk-in units and building a bar in there. And we're also building a bar out here. And we're going to be having a couple live music events. We might do a, a steak class. Uh, we're going to try to utilize this space more now that we have it covered with a tent. So you guys look on our website or if you're on our email list, get email updates about our classes this summer. Because, this summer, you know, these classes, are they're a lot of fun. Because in the restaurant, you come in and we try to give you the most information we can. Because that's part of a dining experience is what's the story, not just what's the food on the plate, right? What is, what are you doing here? What's the background? How'd you cook it? You know, there's a the whole story behind most good food. So the classes are fun because we get to spend like three hours with this captive audience of like, here are all the stories about all the food. And to me as a customer, you get to enjoy learning about that where it's not so fast, like come in the restaurant, eat the, order the food, eat the food and leave. So we're going to keep expanding on these classes here. And, but before you know it, Pat will just be teaching them start to finish. Hey, this is Tony from the Colorado Barbecue Boys. And with me, I got a Cody. Zach. Hey, we just did a class today here at AJ's. Yeah, it was awesome. And it was awesome. It was way better than I thought it'd be, honestly. I agree. Yep. It was. It's worth. How much was the price? It's like one twenty-five. It's it's worth all hundred and twenty-five dollars. Yeah. I've paid a lot of money for other classes, for other places, other barbecue places. And not only do they show you from start to finish, but they show you finished product. They show you the sides. They show the history about barbecue. It was Andrew fun. Recipes. Jared, he was super charismatic in the wow. way, the way he gave the class. Um, another, another really notable thing was they're going to share the recipes with us. They're not hiding yep. it. You know what? They, they want us all to make great barbecue just like they're doing. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, I was really impressed. Like most places are like, okay, cool. Here's how we do it. But you don't get the secret sauce. And they're like, nope. Here's the rubs. Here's the sauce. Yeah. Here's 
literally everything. So this is the, what, the best class I've ever had. Yeah, and I think I've had a lot of classes, but I never had a guy who taught the class who was so passionate about barbecue. You name a barbecue, you name a spot anywhere region in the United States, he could tell you where that yep. was. Yep. And I think that to me holds a lot. Like he's not just a restaurant owner, he's actually passionate about what he does. And he definitely, uh, he, he liked giving me a hard time about it, but he also said it's a great thing to have in the arsenal. That is a true statement. He said, start backwards. You know, start with, if you do have a trigger and you like it as a good product, go to the green egg like Cody has. Then go to the offset, like Cody's looking for an offset too. So I think we all want to go further and further. Yeah. What's the next step? Right, and everyone has a different profile. Yeah. But the one thing I did like about this, but if you were to tell me a guy from Chicago would school me on barbecue and barbecue history, I'd bullshit, I put $100 on it, maybe 200. And this guy will go yep. head to head with uh, Daniel Vaughn, the barbecue snob, he'll go head to head with him on the history and barbecue and things like that. He knows, he, sh he really and he understands stuff. and loves the science of it. That's pretty cool too. Yeah, you're right. He did talk a lot about the science. So come on down to AJ. They're always, they're always friendly. They're always personable. I've never had a bad experience here. And now they're teaching what they do and they're holding nothing back. Yeah. And it's all about the tech spirits. I mean, when we talked about, he talked about Franklin's, talked about Tootsie's and Snow's, Lexington, the things that we liked, yeah. Mickle Weights. Yeah, that, he knew Mickle Weights, no, which most people don't know. In fact, I found it after these guys left on our last trip, so we're gonna head yep. on this trip. But. So Cody and I have never been, but I'm looking forward to yep. trying it. I'm still gonna be buying their barbecue and loving every bite of it. Yeah, I would agree. In fact, you just bought some before. We're, we're about to leave here. Yeah. <laughs> but if you wanna know how this tastes, we did a review. Click the video right here, you can see that, and uh, go check it out. We'll see you over there. All right, thank you all.